So several are going down to, to celebrate his 80th birthday with him. And that's typically John and his team. Yeah. Yeah. That's very nice. Okay, so now to today's meeting. Um, as the saying goes, we don't need to introduce so Hamish, because Hamish is, is the conservation society. But it says here that he read classics at Oxford and so naturally became a programmer. Now, one of our latest speakers in, in this, this year, I think, um, is Tony Hall, and I think he read Classics Rock 2. So I know now why I missed my way. I read Maths at Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> then he went into work for ICT and his predecessors for many years to Cambridge. Um, he's at BCS and so on. Also Martin Wright, welcome. Also ICL, 37 years, or a record. And he's going to tell us interesting things about the CAFs, and probably not the most interesting things. But we'll see what we get out of it. Can I preface with a paragraph that's got nothing to do with caps, but that's something I learned today. In 11 days time, it will be exactly 100 years since the British Tabulating Machine Company was launched. So you can say we're precious near the 100th anniversary of the data processing industry in this country. <laughs> now, this talk is essentially a continuation of the presentation on the ICL CAF system, which was given to the Society by Vic Manor and others on the 28th of January 1993, at which the functionality of CAFs was fully described. Uh, since looking round, I think nearly all of you uh, been either at that meeting or no CAFs intimately. There's no need for me to go to the rest of that page which talks to summarize what CAFs does. I first encountered CAFs in the mid-1970s. At that time, I, with many others, had been engaged for over 10 years in the struggle to computerize ICL's own basic administrative systems. And in this context, I was awake, made aware of CAFs and at once became an ardent enthusiast. The developers had reached the stage where they wanted to try their machine out on a real file and apply to us for help. They could hardly go out to a customer. It made sense to look internally for a convenient file of searchable data. And it was decided that the personnel file at 45 megabytes was a suitable size. <coughs> so after some judicious scrambling of personal details, a copy was taken up to Stevenage for the team to play with. Perhaps I should explain that at this stage, CAFs was not highly thought of in Putney. Corporate marketing was in thrall to a fat Australian slob whose sole policy idea was to watch IBM and do what they were doing. But if you follow IBM, by definition, you are behind. In his view, IBM didn't have a CAFs, so why should ICL have one? He didn't seem able to understand that CAFs would make an ICL system more efficient and that this would give us an advantage. Our argument was that IBM would never implement a CAFs because it would make their systems more intelligent and efficient and that would interfere with their policy of covering the world five foot deep in dumb blue boxes. So for top ICL management, CAFs was a bit suspect. And indeed, when Chris Wilson was managing director, he thought he'd killed it off altogether. But Gordon Scarrett, being a wily old bird, kept it going under the counter and out of sight. Now, this is out of chronological sequence, but it seems a good idea to make the point here. 
We got a friendly consultancy firm to load the same file onto three systems, an ICL 2966 and two IBM giants, a 3081 and a 3033. And we ran the same inquiry on all three from three terminals mounted side by side as a race with these dramatic results. The response time on the ICL machine was averaging about 45 seconds. On the two IBM boxes, it was out at between three and four minutes. The mill usage on the ICL machine, it was less than one second of mill on the 2966. Uh, on the IBM boxes, you can see how high up the scale that is. Uh, we don't show on there the relative power in uh, of, of the processors involved, but both the blue boxes were vastly more more powerful than the 2966. Um, the, the 3081 would charge 160 pounds for one of the inquiries. On the ICL machine, the mill usage was so small it hardly charge anything. So it's terrific. We didn't, I think, in retrospect, make enough marketing noise about that comparison. While the experiments with the personnel file were going on, one thing that particularly struck me was the attention that the CAFS team paid to nuances of language in the way users expressed their inquiries. For example, imagine Morse saying to his sidekick, Lewis, Get me a list of all the blue and green fiestas in Oxford. Well, you know and I know that he didn't mean fiestas that were painted both blue and green at the same time. He meant fiestas where the color was either blue or green. So how could software detect in the inquiry the latent or behind the expressed and? That was the sort of subtlety that the CAFS team were, were considering and I found very impressive. The ultimate CAFS inquiry software had linguistic subtleties that were way beyond any contemporary rival. From watching users' preferences, it offered stem matching as the norm and exact matching as an option. In specifying a range of values, one could distinguish between an inclusive from to and an exclusive between and. And there was a built-in quorum facility, it was lovely. One could say, get the records which satisfy any three out of these five conditions or one could attach numeric weights to individual conditions and specify the total score which a record had to achieve in order to be counted as a hit. And lots of other subtle assumptions to make it as easy as possible to understand and use with the minimum of typing for the user. By contrast, one has only to think of SQL, which I think, like many software products emerging from the IBM world, was never designed for use by human beings. Another interesting fact is that CAFS was designed to search equally effectively on formatted data and text. And at that time, there were data systems, and there were document storage and management systems. For documents, IBM had stairs, everybody else had forms of status. And the records in our data files might contain textual elements, but that text was dumb and useless, only carried around with the data until it could be printed out. But now, it could be used in inquiries. The time quite soon came when personnel management demanded CAF's access to the live personnel file, not just for experimental copy. And as soon as they got it, the world changed. The personnel director told me that he was used in board meetings to being the bad guy, the one who delayed decisions because he would have to go back to the files, do an analysis, and report back in six weeks' time. Now, when a question arose, Sadly, it was usually about whether this or that redundancy program was more viable. He could nip into the anteroom, ask the questions, and reappear with the answers before all the coffee cups had been refilled. And the status of the personnel function rose like a rocket. So, in 1979, it was decided to release a CAFS product to market. It came in the form of the CAFS 800, a wardrobe-sized first-generation product packaged with a 2942 processor running the 1900 DME operating system. The content addressable store 
was held on up to 14 60 megabyte exchangeable disks. Because the fact CAF's search mechanism itself was much faster than the disk transfer rate, some of the disk units were modified so that 10 tracks could be read simultaneously, thus bringing the transfer rate and hence the searching rate up to a respectable 3 megabytes per second. The searching software, before it could be released, was modified by the Black Brackle software factory, and unfortunately, in productizing it, they lost some of the finer linguistic subtleties. But it was still a superb package, flexible, varied, easy to use. Discerning customers began to take advantage of it. The North Yorkshire Police were our first experience of the police world, but we come later on, got a lot of excitement. And the first thing that they used CAFs for was during the visit of Pope John Paul to, Paul, uh, to York Racecourse. The pilot application dealt with lost and found property and reuniting lost parents with their children. Uh, they went on to build an incident logging system uh, covering crimes, accidents, beat complaints, missing persons, um, lost and found property, and so on. With this, CAPS jumped <coughs> straight into the, the main line of police activity. Crucial factors were that the system was made available force-wide. The information wasn't restricted to those pen pushers at force headquarters. The second level of applications included things like burger alarms and garage call-out, where uh, garage owners have to be held on a, roast, a roster and get called in turn to attend an accident. And if one garage doesn't turn up, then he loses grinding points, gets shut down the, the roster and so on. Next, uh, Civil Aviation Authority took a CAPS 800 and uh, used it principally for handling the occurrence reporting system, which not only deals with official reports, but also was able to cope with um, the unofficial reports that anybody in the aircraft industry, pilot, uh, baggage handler, uh, traffic controller, could submit this happen, or we think you will take note of that. And it's very useful to be able to scan all the text of those and analyze and look for trends. Putting it on caps dramatically improved the accessibility and response. Two bottom lines on this 30-year-old slide uh, refer to Hull Telephones. Uh, the Hull Telephone Company uh, exists with two objectives, one of which is not to be the same as BT. Uh, and they did uh, those two uh, topics. And they also uh, had directory inquiries within the uh, That was interesting because the post office, as it then was, had done a major directory inquiries uh, experiment <coughs> with CAPS before ICL took the decision to, to launch CAPS on the world. And the, you were involved in the directory inquiries? DQ's Tony? Yes. Um, so the thing I remember about that was when the experiment came to an end, the terminals had to be switched off and there were floods of tears in the operating room as the operators had to go back to looking up numbers in the paper directory. Uh, at Computel, Basil Cousins, that fine fellow, um, <laughs> devised a, a service where his users could mount their files on the Computel system and use the Computel CAFs to answer their inquiries. It was technically a viable thing to do, but I don't think it was ever a commercial success. But his firm, Computel, were interesting because they examined a lot of the possibilities of integrating CAFs with other technologies, like the IDMS uh, database, view data, and even in those early days, word processing. 
uh, individuals from Hull Telephones and Computel became important members of the CAFS consultancy brotherhood. I originally said Matthew at that point, but I thought brotherhood sounds funny. Oh, dear. Oh, I haven't got a, haven't got a slide for this. In, in house ICL, we used CAFS 800 for personnel and a number of other applications. Um, they need to spend more time on that. In total, there were some 20 CAFS 800 installations, which was pretty good going for such a non-mainline product. But there was one strategic snag with CAFS 800. It worked on the old 1900 environment with six-bit characters, where text was case-blind. And everyone could see that the future lay with bytes the 2900 architecture, and the VME operating system. Of course, the 1900 environment had been ideal for the development of such a revolutionary product. One could get at the hardware and tell it exactly what to do. VME, by contrast, has been described as a system designed to prevent the programmer taking advantage of the hardware. <laughs> More importantly, in its early years, VME certainly didn't provide a stable enough environment to support a project combining experimental hardware and software. Another problem was that the CAFS 800 software was read-only. Thus, the data which CAFS was to search had to be maintained by some other software and then copied into searchable form at suitable intervals. This was acceptable where the data was relatively static or at least slow moving, but we and our customers were increasingly aware that the biggest benefit would come when CAF searching was applied to highly volatile data. The company decided, yes, there should be a CAFs in the 2900 world, and an excellent team at West Gorton designed the hardware. In typical second generation fashion, the size went from wardrobe to shoebox, and the resulting module could be accommodated within the frame of a standard disk controller. Out went the complication of reading from many tracks simultaneously, but disk transfer rates had gone up, and the resulting search rate of 1.2 megabytes per second was deemed acceptable. Everybody wanted to minimize any disturbance to VME itself, so there was to be no CAF-specific low-level software. Instead, CAF's capability was neatly hidden inside the existing index sequential access mechanism. The initiation of a CAF search simply appeared to that mechanism as the outward transfer of a record. As a minor consequence, the core of facility, though still present in the hardware, was not fully supported at the software level. The sparks started to fly when it came to the design of the user level software to go with the new CAFs. Bracknell, where software came from, had gone all relational, and ignoring all the linguistic and psychological experience of Stevenage, had produced an SQL-like SQL package which was touted as the company's official offering. So the new CAFs ISP came out into the world with the dismal query master which was soon supplemented by two programming tools, the relational CAFS interface and the direct CAFS interface, and by the even simpler CAFS search option, which was an extension to the 2900 system control language. Nevertheless, although I may be rude about it, Query Master gave good service to a large number of people, and we'll quickly flip through some of those. Uh, a picture of one of the less exciting bits of Queensland with a police jeep going across it. Uh, we got to know the Queensland police quite well. Uh, quote from them, police forces need to be able to search huge quantities of unstructured data at high speed. You never know when a particular piece of information could become a key factor in solving a crime. QPS achieved great success with Curie Master as soon as they got it. Next. Austin Reed had a big inventory file updated overnight with the day's sales, controlling production control, ordering, delivery van, head building, etc. Suddenly everyone wanted a terminal, 
Everyone could see the benefits of access at such high speed to their own data. Because it's the user who asks the question, the answer he gets has far greater credibility than those which used to emerge from the DP department. Mm. The former inhabitant of a DP department I can share that with you. Berkshire County Council have already made extensive use of view data to make a lot of council information available to the public. The library catalogue, covering over 300,000 titles, was also accessible by view data, but it, in that mode it was far too cumbersome and slow. Use of the relational CAFS interface provided the general public with a quick and easy way to find the right book, whether in Reading or among the shelves of any library operating throughout the county. Uh, Northampton Borough Council, typical inquiries on the income and expenditure annual transactions file, which held one and a quarter million records. Response time dropped from two to three hours to two to three minutes, with an enormous impact on the usability of the system from the end user's point of view. End users, I like this, end users became another development resource executing and defining their own inquiries instead of asking the computer staff for ad hoc reports. Use quickly spread to environmental health, accountancy and finance, legal and commercial, housing rents, vehicle maintenance, housing repairs, technical services and the establishment section. Sheffield Metropolitan District Council had a similar wide range of departments using the facilities. Having established the works costing system, they were surprised by how quickly the works department grasped the concepts and became expert exploiters. One of the store's auditors commented, this is the yes to everything you used to say no to. <clears throat> I wish we'd made more use of that in our marketing. It looked up wonderful night. Yorkshire Water, under the old system, customer inquiries, where the city customer wasn't able to quote its reference number, had to be checked against the street index, which was a 4,000 page printout, or the equivalent of microfiche. Accessing the right account took on average three minutes, but could be as much as 30. There was much wastage of staff time, many return telephone calls, and much inconvenience and annoyance to customers. Putting the same data on CAFs meant that the worst case response time was reduced to only seven seconds. Uh, there was similar results of southern water. And then in Ireland, the dear boys in the insurance industry uh, pooled their uh, resources and found, to, not to anybody's great surprise, that there was a certain amount of fraud. One of the first things they successfully did was searching with CAFs for all those registration numbers of cars which they knew had been written off in the last few years. And then we could then eliminate them from our master files and analyzing the people still claiming to own those cars. Using Query Master and CAFs, over 200 reporting programs were no longer needed. Many, many runs were dramatically speeded up by using the CAF search option, where an existing program was used unchanged, with the CAF search being invoked by the controlling SCL. And then the Oxford University Computing Service. I include this because I think it's only right that there should be some mention of the other university after the emphasis we had on Cambridge last time we were here. Uh, this is Lou Bernard in the foreground, who is now the deputy director of the Oxford University Computing Service. So he's, he's had a long innings there. Quoting him, I'm enthusiastic about the use of computers in the humanities because there's so much untapped potential there. There are all sorts of areas where we can assist research workers giving them the means to race ahead by speeding up the rate at which they can follow up a line of investigation. Where research is speculative and results driven, the speed of CAFs is important because of the changes it makes possible in the characteristic modes of inquiry. 
Hypotheses can be tested as they are formed, and searches can be determined by the results of previous researches. Our experience suggests that CAFS has a qualitative effect on research as well as a quantitative one. Uh, one example, at the Oxford University Press, editors have spent eight years trying to establish the most authentic and accurate text of Shakespeare's work, combining the first folio of 1623 with all 18 substantive quarto texts. Once all these had been put into machine-readable form, the total corpus formed a database that could be searched eight to end, end to end in 17 seconds flat, using less than a second of mainframe process of time. At least a dozen compositors had worked on the first folio, and one particular man had a penchant for semicolons and used more than twice as many of them as any of his colleagues. By successive searches and noting such anomalies as this, the editors were able to pin down many long-standing errors in the original typesetting process of 400 years earlier. The infrared astronomy satellite was launched in 1983 and spent 10 months scanning the heavens, firing a colossal amount of information back to astronomers on Earth. It increased the number of extraterrestrial objects known to man by 40%, with positive identification of 250,000 distinct radiation sources. It took the scientists at the main American Analysis Center about 20 minutes of mainframe process of time, i.e. an elapsed time measured in hours, for each full search through the IRS point source catalog. So each search had to be treated as a batch processing job. At QMC, scientists could run similar jobs interactively, getting results in two elapsed minutes for a fraction of the mainframe load. Uh, because they were able to use CAFs, they were able to adopt a radically different approach, and it proved remarkably successful. Even people using the most expensive supercomputers super are only just managing to keep up with us. Now, uh, the thing that's really important in the academic world, they managed to get their papers published before the American. There's a picture of IRS, just a nice bit of engineering before it went into space. And there's a nice picture of our galaxy end on with, I think those are radiation sources across the frame. So, the reaction to Query Master among the more advanced CAPS 800 users was loud and many colored. In particular, defense users privately described the new software as a sharp step back into the Stone Age. But at a crucial meeting with Rob Wilmot, who was then ICL's managing director, a wily senior RAF group captain mildly asked whether the new CAS software would match the capabilities of what they were used to. And off guard, Rob blandly confirmed that it would. He was thus personally committed to making good a rash public assurance. When the dust eventually settled, we found that the sales division responsible for the <coughs> MOD business was charged with producing software which replicated all the good bits of the CAFS 800 package, plus online updating, plus a large number of other desiderata. It was the right decision, but it took some years to achieve. I didn't get involved with Indipol, which came out of this process, until it was completed. But Martin Wright was involved from the beginning and can tell us more about how it happened if I miss out any crucial details. The initial design meetings for the software took place at Martin's home, which was geographically convenient. Incidentally, we used the same place to plot the organization of this talk. Symmetry there. When it was time to start development, a team was formed in Stevenage, including key people from RADC, where CAFs had originated, the Spence sales and support teams, and people with detailed CAFs 800 experience. In fact, anyone who might be useful and who wasn't tainted with the Bracknell relational dogma. Space was provided, as was the necessary computer, by magic. Normal, normal budget approval processes seem to be short-circuited by the need to make good Rob's commitment. 
Development was fast, but extremely well disciplined. Everything was held in the data dictionary, which was used as the project repository, and was constantly being updated. If it wasn't in the DDS, it wasn't kosher, and it certainly wasn't part of the product. In retrospect, the team remember this as a time of the most intense effort, when engineering principles dominated and conventional procedural rules were ignored. But it certainly worked. And worked well enough to suggest that the conventional procedural rules were perhaps unnecessary. The time came when the development team seemed to have outgrown the capabilities, the, the development tasks seemed to have outgrown the capabilities of the in-house team. So various software houses were invited to the bid of to bid for the work of completing the job. A contract was eventually awarded and work continued, but it soon became apparent that the software house way of doing things was totally unsuitable. So we poached the software house staff who now knew the basis of the product, brought the work back in house, and completed it ourselves. This slide shows how we thought of the overall capabilities of Inbitcom. The prominence given to security reflects the demand for the product in the defence world. Under the surface, Indipol was technically an interpreter, i.e. no part of an Indipol application was compiled. The details of what was required were held in a system model and a data model. The latter described the files, records and fields to be searched and updated using a pragmatic subset of the principles of the associative data model which had grown up with the original CAFs. The system model held material at three levels, system, application, and user. At the system level, all the terms of the language were held, together with any synonyms required for local use. This accessibility of the language meant that by providing synonyms, we could easily translate the system into other languages, Malay, Setswana, and Australian, for example. <laughs> At the application level, the profile of an application, including the screens used for data entry, updating and searching, any macros common to all users of the application, a list of the users together with any rules restricting the access, access permitted to each user, and other detail. Access rules could usefully include restrictive clauses to be appended to each inquiry made by the user. He asked, count all the records in the file, but what gets implemented is count all the records in the file that he's allowed to see. Uh, at the user level, each user saw only the subset of the language and the data to which he was entitled, but could also hold any macros he defined for his own use. All parts of the application could be developed online by a user with sufficient permissions, and within limits each user could personalise his own profile to suit his particular style. Uh, some uses. Indipol rapidly became uh, very common throughout our in-house systems, more as every application we knew of, um, the, the data was put onto uh, appropriate disks. And I forget when I, when I lost count how many CAFs units there were on the in-house processing systems. But it was um, in the high teens, I think, uh, before I, I departed. Yeah, the, there's a list of some of the, the more obvious areas from the corporate and sales uh, side of in-house processing I was concerned with. That slide misses out all the details of manufacturing and so And with, at ICL, defense systems where uh, Indipol uh, ended up, we naturally used it for our own. Uh, any data that we needed to hold and needed to acquire on was accessible through Indipol. And then we come now to the, the police world and we found Indipol 
used in all those areas uh, and, and some others. Let's go through some of the, some of the, the, the forces that are used in the world. Lancashire, uh, Chief, Chief Superintendent Donnelly, standing in front of the splendid building that contained the computer center, communication center, and the control room. Uh, built of uh, a nice looking building, built of breeze block faced with a thin sliver of glossy brick, but equipped with, for some reason, bulletproof glass windows. <laughs> so it was said that the, the uh, standing instruction said that in the event of the computer center coming under armed attack, staff will hide behind the windows. <laughs> <laughs> Lancashire ra rapidly developed a, a straightforward and robust incident logging system. And rapidly made it available throughout the force, and that I think was also uh, key to its uh, usability. The value of having searchable text was well illustrated early on, when a quick scan of the modus operandi put an end to the activities of one prolific family whose speciality was squirting quick setting foam into the burger alarm before breaking into the off license it was protecting. I saw one member of that family on TV only a few weeks ago um, in quite another context. <coughs> Any problems about getting the data entry, uh, getting the data entered, were quickly solved, indeed by the beat sergeant, who said that he used the system as a quick way of finding out what had been happening on his patch since he was last on duty. So any of his chaps who didn't put their incidents into the system uh, got a quick clip on the police air home. We later had an agreement with Lancashire to sell their system on to other users, the effect of which Martin will describe later. Across the Pennines in North Yorkshire, uh, based on their several years' experience with CAFS 800, they built a much more sophisticated intelligence recording system. They had a particularly brilliant IT man uh, who could make Interpol play some tricks even we'd never thought of. Uh, it was a very, very good system, but uh, unfortunately we didn't manage to replicate it elsewhere. Nevertheless, because crime doesn't respect police force boundaries, the New York the North York system became a de facto regional intelligence system with terminals connected to it from police forces in West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Cleveland, and others. And interesting, this didn't happen by agreement between the chief constables that this is a strategic thing we ought to do. With. It happened at the level of intelligence analysts in the various police forces getting together and saying, look, you, you ought to put your data onto our system because then we can play it together and uh, in an unofficial way of going about things, worked very well. By contrast, I, I well remember on my first visit to their headquarters in Inverness, this is the northern Constabulary, Chief Superintendent George Henderson saying to me, you must realize here that crime up here is not at all what you're used to down south. We know perfectly well that if we arrested 12 people on the mainland, and another six, or no, maybe seven, in Orkney, crime would stop. <laughs> and then where would we be? Look at all these figures we have to keep sending into Edinburgh. <coughs> Number of crimes recorded, zero. Number of crimes detected, zero. They've been telling us we don't need police stations in Wick or Thurso, and we're not having that. <laughs> and they took in the ball initially because they wanted a flexible system to cope with the large number of sporting guns being brought into their area. As they explained, more weapons pass through Inverness Airport than through Heathrow, Gatwick, Luton and Stansted combined. <laughs> they also developed an incident logging system, not a straight copy, but based, based quite closely on Lancashire. And that's an indication of the rather different geographical conditions. The criminal there is said to be hiding behind the tree. 
uh, coming closer to home, the British Transport Police, they like to boast that they were the first police force in the world to use IT in the fight against crime. A man committed a murder in Berkshire, caught a London train in Slough, and thought he'd got away with it. But the police telegraphed to Paddington with details of his distinctive overcoat. He was recognized, followed from that station to a hotel in the city, and there arrested. That was in 1844. Um, their Indipol information system was called PIMS and was used uh, nationwide. Um, British Transport Police cover the whole of the, the, the national rail network. They, they don't recognize the border between England and Scotland. Also, they didn't have to bother about the cost of BT lines. All their data traffic could piggyback on the network already installed for signaling and message traffic. Two areas where it was very quickly successful were against pickpocketing gangs on the tube and car thefts from commuter car parks in the home counties. A quirk. They, they developed a spec for a handheld device that would be both a mobile phone and a computer terminal. But it also had to be robust enough to be able to be used as a truncheon. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody successfully bid to supply it. Uh, then, living worldwide, the police de Raja Malaysia, they were quite secretive about their main Indipol applications. And in any case, all the screens were in Malay, which I don't read further. But I know they had an incident system, and another major application was in the area of firearms, and I suspect there was quite a lot of intelligence about uh, intercommunal dealing with intercommunal trouble and work for that They also showed the flexibility of the software by designing an intelligence system specially tailored to planning the protection of visiting VIPs during the Chogham Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Kuala Lumpur in 1989. So they could ask, if that hotel is under attack, which delegations have we got to uh, protect? If the attack is on floor 20, 32 in particular, how do we get Mrs. Thatcher out in time? And it's quite subtle stuff. Fairly close by, but very different in style. The Royal Hong Kong Police, a long history of having to cope with organized crime in the form of the triads who still trade on their original, on, the, on their origin several centuries ago as patriotic societies, although their current activities are nasty and brutal in the extreme. In this country, the Met and the Greater Manchester Police know them only too well. Our main contact in Hong Kong was Detective Chief Superintendent Brian Merritt, a giant of a man, ex-guards and erect as a lamppost. <coughs> He had a very subtle technique when he, when he wanted to clear up a particular street market. He would send his minions, locals, to wait at one end of the street uh, undercover. And then he would enter the market at the other end, walking down the middle of the road, all six foot six of him. And his people would just collect all the little rats who scuttled out away from the street. <laughs> When his tour in Hong Kong was over, he joined us in UK to continue his work in anti-triad intelligence. Apart from police work in the colony, the Hong Kong police were involved in a lot of collaboration he did with the Met and with the Federal Police in Australia. Uh, Hong Kong police also introduced us to Anakapa link charting. Anacapa was a small software company in California who developed a very, very successful set of rules for depicting the connections involved in criminal activity in a graphical form. And I'll flip through some slides to show that we start off now. Who is this chap who's got this identity? He's Wong Ping Fai. Ah, who, who is known as associates? What cases has that, that he been involved in? Has Wong Ping Yu, his brother, been involved in any other? 
And who else was linked to that Goldsmith robbery? What, a, what else would you talk about? And that's the, that's the chart they eventually took to trial. And the quite a large number of members of the 14K were jailed as a result of a, a successful prosecution. Um, the detail is accurate apart from the names. Those we've modified slightly because I don't want any triads after me with a meat to be <coughs> And some of them are probably out by now. Uh, I had an interesting meeting in the late 1980s with the director of the Hong Kong Independent Commission Against Corruption. He said he very much regretted that we went to the police force before going to him, as Indipol would have been ideal for his work. But since his outfit's main focus was against corruption within the Royal Hong Kong Police Force, they clearly couldn't use the same software as they did. Queensland Police was also very sensitive on the subject of corruption when we dealt with them. I mean, the Fitzgerald Commission had just put their previous commissioner away for 12 years. But based on their previous experience with Cat 800, they very quickly put Indipol to good use in a number of areas. They were the first people I knew of to link Indipol to a geographical system with which they plotted where burglaries had been taking place during office hours in a succession of suburbs off the main road between Brisbane and Surface Paradise. They were able to deduce where the gang was likely to strike next, were ready and waiting when they turned up right on cue and bagged a lot of them. Yes. Now Australian Customs, their main target, as you might expect in Australia, was various forms of fraud. A lot of effort also devoted to the ongoing war against drugs. They also had a lot of work to do in combating organized illicit immigration, particularly from Indonesia onto the northwestern coast of Western Australia. Trade in endangered species was also high on their list. Also in Canberra, I remember a meeting with a party of spooks from some federal intelligence agency who may or may not have subsequently developed an Indipol system. What was noteworthy was that at the start of the meeting, they all handed out business cards, which we did collected. It was only later that we saw that their names were given as Gary Cooper, Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, Errol Flynn, and the like. <laughs> New Zealand Customs, total border protection was their motto. And they quickly developed three very effective Indipol applications. CIRAS was a customs intelligence retrieval analysis system operating at two levels. It held masses of raw intelligence derived from whatever source and a more compact intelligence database of information that had been evaluated and analyzed by experienced personnel. One of the advantages of New Zealand's extreme remoteness is that passengers of interest can usually be identified long before their flight has landed. They also had a system called Cases, which was concerned with fraud, prosecutions, and other legal work, and SEPs, which recorded the details of cargo examination or profiling. Together, these systems contributed to the claim that New Zealand has kept the country largely free of imported drugs, with local addicts being dependent on home-baked substances. Now, those are some quick views of a wide variety of uh, applications. There are some users of both the CAFS 800 and of the <coughs> successor product whom we do not identify either then or now. Uh, so I'll leave that to your imagination. Now, uh, if I may, I'll hand over to Martin to talk about some of the other major applications with, each, with which he was concerned. Yes, I, I was associated with Indipol and with uh, CAPS 800 for many years in my time in ICL. And for some reason, I was part of the Indipol development team. 
I never did discover what my role actually was. I think it was called usability. I was supposed to keep an eye on the development people and you know rein in some of their wilder fancies and uh, remind them of the practical bits they missed occasionally. But uh, mainly I provided accommodation, my sitting room for the initial design work. And in fact, we've got the, pretty well the initial design team here today. I think we had the, the first meeting there. Um, and um, then I spent a lot of time uh, enjoying these various design discussions, drew lots of diagrams, um, put a lot of data into the data dictionary, and became an expert tea and coffee maker for the initial team. But uh, at the end of all that, as Hamish should explain, we did produce a rather excellent product which uh, did some very good work. And I became a consultant on Interpol at many sites, some of which, as Hamish has said, we can talk about, some we can't. And the product took me all over the world, from the UK, from Eastern Europe, and Australia and Asia, which uh, had a very good finish to my career in ICL. Uh, one of the most interesting ones in the UK was the Royal Naval Supply and Transport Service. This was the outfit that provided the complete logistics service for the, na for the Navy. Um, their main centre was at Ensley near Bath, and they had main bases and stores depots all across the UK and Gibraltar, all linked um, by their existing system. Um, they had terminals deep underground, indeed, at the old Bath stone quarries. Um, they stocked something like 800,000 items, and they had 4.5 million issues a year at the time we came on the scene in the mid-80s. They had an excellent IDMSX-based inventory control system called CRISP, uh, which ran the day-to-day -day work extremely well, but it, and it had some standard management information features which uh, many people could do online inquiries, but only of a very limited nature. But the system was not good at ad hoc inquiries. This was uh, the big problem. Um, ad hoc inquiries were handled by handcrafted COBOL programs, which by the time we came along had a six-month backlog, which made uh, management rather difficult, and uh, difficult to hold the information that was worth anything. And of course, because of this delay, when the user did ask information, uh, they were asking for more and more output at a time on the basis that it might just be needed, it might just come in at some point. Um, this was not a good situation for the accuracy information, um, or for the life of trees, um, because people were asking for information in sort of doorstep size lumps. And, uh, this was decided was not the best way to get accurate management information. Interpol was selected as the solution to this problem basically because of rapid response and ease of use and simplicity of implementation. A team of four <coughs> designed and implemented a pilot system in a couple of weeks. Uh, the team was only four people, joint RN, RN and ICL, and I was one of the team. The files were copied from their uh, IDMSX system once a week, which was quite often enough for accurate management information. And this process also, this weekly update, the time got enhancements in the system. So the project went from pilot to full scale by way of frequent small enhancements without any major quantum leaps. One problem that arose was the meaning of terms. Things like stock, example. If you ask a purchasing officer what stock is, that could be what he's got on order. If you ask a warehouse man, it would be what's on the shelf. Well, if it's a repair shop manager, he'd say it's the things, the work in progress that you've got in the, in the workshop. So you've got a problem there that interpretation over a big system like this. You had a lot of users, all of different, with different hats on, and it was found that letting absolutely every end user onto the system was a little bit tricky because people would ask a question to <coughs> get the wrong answer because they hadn't pitched it quite right. So the solution they came up with was to have a trained operative in each location um, so that users, end users would go to their local Interpol specialist who was never more than <coughs> 100 yards away from them and pitch the question at this specialist who knew a, the Interpol database, and B, the business. So that when somebody came along and asked what, what, what stock they'd got, the first thing was, where do you come from? 
therefore we know what stock you mean. And this system worked extremely well. And of course it meant that when we brought in new features and new items and new bits and pieces, there were only a relatively few people that had to be trained up in it. And that sort of information was then available very quickly and more importantly, very accurately. So now answers were available in minutes rather than months and were accurately aimed at current problems. So we managed to substitute the rapier for the bludgeon. Users were hooked on the system within days. One manager of contracts with Rolls-Royce said that for the first time in years, he'd been able to deal with the supplier on equal terms. Up to that point, his information on contracts and the way things were developing were totally out of date, and the contractors were running rings around him. But once he got in the pub, he could be prepared right up to date, and his information was good and accurate, and he was able to, let's say, deal with them on equal terms. Certainly, the, uh, the Royal Navy claimed savings of £2 million in the first year on reduced stocks because they were able to look through, see what was being used, see what was duplicated, and get all that sort of stuff out of the system, uh, improve repair times, and get a, remove all the uh, duplications. The Army followed the same track and put a very similar system in at ROC at Vista, where they were able to, again, make vast savings on eliminating spare stocks, duplicate stocks, and accurate <coughs> information. An interesting point was made about the scale of military stores. I mean, everybody's got store systems. But the point was made by a major motor manufacturer at one time that the stores were many times larger than any commercial organization would have. And the rate of movement was such that a commercial firm would hold none of the millions of items that they held in stock in stock. The rate of movement was such that they would all be back ordered from the manufacturer. So military stores were a totally different ball game to any form of commercial stores. And Indipol, um, as I say, was helping both the Navy and the Army on this, these things. The RAF, unfortunately, we didn't manage to make a sale in because they'd gone to some other manufacturer for their mainframe and didn't wish to uh, double up on their kit to uh, even though they rather liked the inquiry system. But one RAF one we did have was RAF Swanton Morley, which was the repair and maintenance record center up in the back of beyond in North Norfolk. Uh, there they used it for analyzing all the maintenance and repair dockets to look for trends, find out common problems, and find out um, common solutions. Uh, that was a very successful one up there. So. Uh, those are some of the ones we can talk about that happened in the UK. Overseas, we're a little bit free to be able to talk. How about that for a headline? Does that uh, sound familiar at the moment? Subprime lending? It is not a new, a new thing. The Australians invented it years ago. Now, what was Trico? Trico was the Tricontinental Bank, uh, which was a merchant bank owned by the State Bank of Victoria in Australia. The Australians had a pretty poor view of merchant banks from an early time. There's a lovely quote here from Governor Lachlan Macquarie in 1810. He says, Petty banking has thrown open the door to frauds and impersonations of a most grievous nature to the country at large. The persons principally concerned in this nefarious practice are to be found amongst the lowest orders of society. Such being the credulity of the people, that notes of hand issued by these wretches are taken and passed into free circulation as if guaranteed by the best securities. Familiar? <laughs> Trico had a managing director, one Ian Johns by name, who sought to make lots of money for himself and his friends by lending large sums of State Bank of Victoria money on the security of the shares that were bought with these loans. Interesting method. Uh, fine when prices were going up, but not when they went down, as it did in the late 80s. As a result of that, Trico collapsed, bankrupting the state bank, and basically bankrupted the state of Victoria. The uh, <coughs> government had to bail out Victoria in quite a big way. And when the dust settled, what's the usual thing they do there? Set up a Royal Commission of Inquiry, of course. Find out who done it 
what they've done, and is it possible to retrieve anything from the wreckage? So they set up this Royal Commission, and ICL won the support contract with Interpol. Again, because Interpol was an easy thing to put up, a very small ICL staff was, was put together, including myself, for part of the time. We set up shop in the Royal Commission offices in Melbourne, and uh, we had a small 2900 mainframe, and a network of terminals for use by council and by the Royal Commission officers. The sort of information that uh, was held on there was records of credit submissions, who had the loans, for how much, what security, and who approved them. Funnily enough, it was usually Ian Johns who approved them. And there was a relatively small circle of his friends and associates that they were made to. Um, the records of the share tradings from the investment banking system. There was State Bank of um, Victoria archives, data on Trico's activities. There was a transcript, which was a very interesting thing. The daily verbatim record of the courtroom activity was loaded every night, so it was available online to council and officers the following morning. There was a correspondence file, all the letters and things that had been impounded who they were from, who they were to, who was involved, and a registry of everything where it was and who had it. The sort of usage um, that was put to, um, the Royal Commission officers were uh, using it for research, who did what, where, how much, what evidence there was, to put questions to the people in the dock. And in court, they actually had terminals in the courtroom, so the council could be using the system to say, well, Yesterday, Mr. So-and-so, you said such-and-such. Such. Uh, today, you say so-and-so. And the documents show that actually it was something totally different. Could you please explain? Uh, this was a very good, very good reaction on this. And um, the inquiry couldn't actually have functioned without the system. I see in Australia used in Nepal in other similar inquiries. Uh, the Australians seem to have plenty of financiers with interesting co concepts of truth and honesty. And uh, there were several of these major inquiries going on to try and sort out who did what, with which, to whom, and when. <coughs> they caught quite a few that way. It was also used to analyse insurance claims for the motor insurers. And um, it was threw up an interesting fact that at one time every household in one particular street in Melbourne had a claim outstanding for whiplash injury. And amazingly, they used the same doctor and the same solicitor. The insurance company were impressed. We thought we had a sale. But they said this trial had given their prosecution department enough work to keep them going flat out for two years, and they couldn't afford the risk we might find even more. <laughs> so that's the This is another interesting application. I don't know whether you know anybody who know Botswana, but basically. It's one of the nicest countries in Africa. Unfortunately, now ravaged by AIDS. But it's peaceful, democratic, friendly, provided not of the law, and rich from diamonds and beef. They've got a Westminster model government and legal system. And in the early 90s, they had a central government computer system on an ICL mainframe, and a national telecom outfit, which we'll hear more, called BT, with the same sort of BT's bad habits that we know and love. Um, but they had a relatively low crime rate uh, compared with South Africa next door. To give some example of the difference in feeling there, staff moving from Joburg to Gavarani found that at first their children were not going to sleep at night because there were no bars on the windows, no barbed wire, high walls, and no armed response units. But police performance did need improving. Uh, they had no interest in what the neighbouring South African police were doing, which was not surprising, because that building has still got, you can't see them there, it's got bullet holes in it. Because in the years previous to this time, um, the South Africans had come zooming over the border, ignoring little things like borders and national boundaries and things, uh, chasing in hot pursuit of the ANC. And several times they um, went through the middle of Gaborone, shooting up anything that moved, quite a few things that didn't. So the local police didn't really have much uh, time for South Africans and their methods. 
So they looked to the UK for assistance. And as Hamish mentioned, we had the right to um, spread the Lancashire Police recording system around the world. And this was one of the places that took it. Um, again, a small team from the UK. Um, again, as I said before, in the world only small teams. Um, uh, was uh, set up. And for some reason, I'm not quite sure I ended up as a project manager for the project. And we had a small team rewriting the bits where the Botswana system was a little bit different from the UK system. For example, they had um, a three-level court system. They had a crown court, district court, and a tribal court. And uh, they had the fines were payable in four currencies. You could either pay your fines in the local pooler, in South African rands, or dollars, or sterling. They didn't really mind as long as they got the money. And they would change the things like details of which instruments could be used for which corporal punishment whether it was a, a rattan rod or a leather strap, depending on the level of the uh, uh, offence and uh, the court that it was dealt with in. And some local traffic laws had to be updated as well. There was one splendid one, which you were not allowed to have more than three donkeys abreast pulling your cart. <laughs> so once these had all been done, uh, the whole thing was uh, put together and training started. Um, the biggest task was to train the staff or input inquiry. Botswana people were highly educated, but not many of them actually had much contact with computers. So there was training consultants set up. We had a very nice room in the police training academy, and sort of started off with the uh, lecturer walking around the room, carrying the keyboard, saying, if you press that, you get an A. And that sort of level where we started from, but because they were a bright lot, by the end of the first week, they were all playing solitaire, like old hands. In fact, the machine used to crash because you've got 32 sets of solitaire stacked on top of each other before so nobody had bothered to switch one off. So they rapidly became actually extremely good operators. <coughs> one of the great problems, though, was getting a link from the police training college back to the mainframe. This is where what's that Botswana Telecom, in the same way as our good old British Telecom, you could nag them and nag them, you could chase them, you could threaten them, but nothing happened. But at last, suddenly, one morning at 8.30, the link was found to be working. Unfortunately, at 9 o'clock, there was a furious call from the finance ministry who wanted their link back. <laughs> BT the same the world over? So this system went live after 12 months, and it had its first successful arrest within two weeks. And the system continued until the government moved away from mainframe computing. Well, that's a couple of uh, um, slightly more varied ones from the interval selection. And I'll hand back to Hamish. Thanks, Margaret. A uh, little more to say, really. Um, we're not able to confirm, but we believe that some interval systems are still in use at the present time. Uh, the last time I knew definitely on this was a uh, party just before last Christmas, uh, when I was uh, informed that several organizations were still paying uh, software license fees for Indicom. So I think it's had a successful uh, career, and I think that career may still be uh, going on uh, successfully. But again, as we've said, I think, a couple of times, there have been areas of independent use that things may be going on that we don't know about and never will. But just to, to round off, uh, let's look at some of the uh, final happy things we can say. Uh, CAFS was, was really quite well thought of. We got that award from the Office Automation uh, magazine in 1985. We got that one from computing, called CAF's product of the decade. And computing was not on the whole favorably disposed towards ICL. Uh, so we were quite glad to rub their noses in that from time to time. We got the Queen's Award for Technological Innovation, again also in 1985. And one of which I'm particularly proud 
Indipol uh, or the CAF's fuzzy matching capability got a review in the pages of Punch. <laughs> this is the only, only, only ICL product I think was ever traced by the forecast <laughs> journal. So th that came about because we published a poster uh, talking about fuzzy matching, so that we could even find a noodle in a hat track. Um, <laughs> Michael Bible picked that up and made a lovely story out of it. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we've had fun. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. was a search engine implemented in hardware. Um, the, the search was executed directly on the data stream down as, as the data came off the disk into the disk controller. Um, compare that with conventional uh, searching in a non-CAFS environment, where if, you, if you're having to do a, a serial search across a file, you heave each block from the file Disk, into the disk controller, up to the mainframe, then you search through it record by record, discarding probably 95% of them as you go. Um, so the, the time is time is spent doing a lot of useless work on stuff that you don't want. Uh, with CAFs, you export the entire selection task down to the lowest level of the hardware, the data stream actually coming off the disk. The only thing is to get through are the records that satisfy the search criteria. So the traffic between this controller and the mainframe is minimized. Everything that comes back to the mainframe level is relevant to what's going on. So you get these giant uh, improvements in productivity <coughs> and effectiveness with, with, with no increase in the load on the mainframe. In fact, the load on the mainframe is dramatically reduced because it's not, not, not having to deal with anything that's irrelevant. Is that, is that, is that it? Could it deal with wildcards or yes. regular expressions? Um, there was a, a basic facility you could, uh, in, 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 a, in, in a search term, you could indicate that one character was doubtful. Placing to say put an asterisk in that position and it would allow anything through in, in that one character position. Uh, um, because when you output the search value that we're looking for, when you send that down to the house, you also sent uh, a, a mask telling the CAFS hardware how to uh, select the data. That, was, that could be used for a variety of things, but fuzzy matching was a good example. There was an extension of that uh, where you could say, at this point, I'm not sure how this word is spelled, so allow, allow several uh, fuzzy characters at that position. That actually used uh, several, uh, so it, it propagated a number of different search terms down below the surface, but it had the same effect. What you could not do with CAFs uh, was any of the things like proximity matching. Uh, get me this word within five of the other word. Uh, you could do, you could select the records which had this, the, the target words in them. But then the proximity matching you would have to do by, by software back in the main thread in the conventional manner. Uh, you also couldn't do any search which involved arithmetic on the values down in the file. You could, you could only uh, deal directly with the value that was actually in the file. Uh, so that meant that in some applications, you had to do some, uh, some work in advance saying we'd better calculate that uh, 
uh, just hold the price and the quantity, but better hold the extended value and put that in the record. And then search. Um, one other one we had, I think, was fairly quite unique, was it could search geographical terms, latitude and longitude. All oh, right. Yeah. And you can search areas by defining greater than, less than corners of squares. I think we can, we can extend that by saying there was some difficulty uh, in 1982 when it was realized that the Falklands were actually in the southern hemisphere and, and southern latitudes are rather different from north. <laughs> Just as a rhyme on that, I recently typed my own latitude and longitude into Google Maps. I live at 51 minutes west. And it came back with the map 50 minutes 60 seconds west. So when people learn how to do compound rounding. <laughs> Are these days or is it the, the fact that the data transfer rates are now so fast that they, people don't need to be as clever as uh, brute force in those days? <laughs> I, I think <coughs> in, in the early days of CAPS, um, you, everything was accessible if you could afford to spend the time uh, <coughs> building multiple indexes. For most practical applications, you were stuck with a primary index of possibly one uh, orthogonal, if there was a, a sufficiently useful direction to come at it, orthogonally. Nowadays, I think things like Google, uh, they don't search for anything. They know where everything is. They, uh, they can, so by, by, Playing with multiple indexes and doing joins across them 
very cleverly, uh, they, they can get you straight to the, the page that you thought you wanted. But of course, what they can't do is pick up the interesting pages that haven't been added to their indexes. So that's what cats could do. It's another instance where the world has moved on, I suppose. Yes. Do things differently. Yes. Um, I, can I interject? I think there were two issues there. Um, of course, in those days we were talking, we were talking about optimizing the use of expensive and reliable mainframe as part of the optimization. Nowadays, you don't need to optimize in the same way because the computers are cheap and you uh, as many as you like. Um, also, make another remark. About uh, the IBM menace, as it were, and uh, following IBM's, I like that quote, very nice quote, following IBM and get what behind. And you mentioned Oxford having a gas at the university, well, because at the same time I was running an IBM mainframe in Cambridge, um, and learning very quickly, as we now know today, that it doesn't matter what you do, but the big guys win. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's Microsoft or, or nothing. It's the same sort of situation. Less, less room for innovation, but um, I still think that uh, the CAPS is a really fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it before. Uh, I don't think many people at the time realised uh, outside of it, just what the potential was. One point on that, but when we developed uh, CAPS, the mainframe that we have was 256K instructions per second, and uh, I think uh, PC on my desk now is, uh, may have got me with the wrong, something like 10,000 times that uh, that speed. So, uh, and there wasn't a 10,000 ratio in your first slide between the uh, between the time taken on the uh, on the IBM mainframe to do the same job. So um, uh, the balance really has tipped with faster hardware. One, one other point. Uh, uh, you mentioned Google uh, performing everything uh, with elaborate indexing. Uh, the Interval software um, also allowed for indexes, and um, it's a very important part of this. And we had a principle that uh, uh, we would apply the query to the indexes. So if somebody uh, was looking for um, uh, a, a name that began with a J and a salary uh, greater than 5,000, uh, we would go to the salary index, we would go to the uh, surname index, and we would intercept the results to a strip where we searched with CAFs. And uh, uh, fairly obviously there was there were cutoffs in that, uh, so that one didn't uh, make sure that one didn't lengthen the uh, time by playing too long with the with the indexes. But uh, the principle of applying the query to the index information first and then applying it to the data using the result as a restriction uh, is uh, the way that Indipod worked for search. I think there are, there are two other topics that we haven't uh, covered here. They're, they're both, in a way, part of the CAF story. One was the delightful fire correlation unit. Um, which, uh, exactly following Jim's point, was a, a solution to the relational join problem before that problem had been defined. Uh, and uh, a super bit of technology that never made it uh, out of the laboratory. Uh, another bit, though, that did, uh, came back to the Hong Kong uh, police and the incident, Charting uh, directly out of the Hong Kong experience, we built up a thing called the Intelligence Analysts Workbench, which automated the production of those charts of connections. Very effective it was. The, the biggest case I knew of. There's a murder that happened in Lancashire. Uh, can I carry on? Uh, 
an accountant, uh, had been out for the day with his family, came back home, and there were armed men in his house. And one of them took the family inside and kept them there. The other took him out of the garage and shot him. Um, this, well, the Greater Manchester Police immediately thought, this is not a normal burglary. Uh, but they weren't sure where to start until a private detective uh, firm in Manchester said that they had recently had a, a contract from a chap in New York to find the address of a particular accountant who lived at Chorley just outside Bolton. And they'd reported their finding to their client the morning of the preceding day. And within 36 hours, the accountant was, was dead. So that led the police of, it, it turned up many countries to get involved in a very large investigation. At the root of the story was a scam involving the uh, selling of um, fake uh, Marlboro cigarettes by somebody who had got some Marlboro cigarette packaging material and could sell uh, cigarettes based on this and a lot of story. He could do it cheaply under the counter in Venezuela and nobody would know that in the American customs. <coughs> um, people were invited to tender to buy a container load of these cigarettes for a quarter of a million dollars and a number of mugs did. And one of the people who were involved in the accountancy for uh, running this scam, not realizing it was a scam, was this uh, Bolton accountant who happened to be in the Caribbean, called in on Venezuela to inspect the organization, found that there were in fact no cigarettes, there was no cigarette factory. There was a ship, but she was in dock and condemned, would never float again. Uh, and so he wanted his money out of the system. But because he now knew too much, he had to be eliminated. By the time the perpetrator had been uh, caught in New York, the amount of information that had accumulated in the inquiry was phenomenal. There were uh, telephone calls, I think it was over 7,000 telephone calls long, which were significant. Tens of thousands of other incidents. Uh, the number of names of people involved was in the high hundreds, and so on. So the, the figures were enormous. And the only way of keeping control, control of this vast amount of information was to use the Anacapa charting to, to lay it out on paper so you can see it. And in the incident control room in Lancashire Constabulary, the uh, the charts were laid out on a wall about the width of the end of this hall and were uh, four feet high and uh, a small team involved in doing that was, was very effective. They got the bloke eventually uh, to his great surprise because he is a New Yorker and uh, in New York in those days, if a murder's more than three days old, well, it's a, a cold case. And these weird fellows from Lancashire, they were still after him after two years. He couldn't believe it, but they got him, and he's probably still inside. But that, uh, that charting was the only way of bringing that case to court in a way that would be intelligent. It makes me think that on some of the big uh, fraud cases that are brought to, uh, to trial now, uh, British courts, are, uh, there are people on all four sides. We ought to consider rearranging them on three sides, the fourth side being a display war. So that, uh, well, I reckon we also, also to be able to say 
uh, during the course of presenting the evidence. Now, on, we've, we've been talking about that connection on that chart. Do you, the jury, now agree that we have proved that bit? And progressively, tick off the bits, colour off the bits that have been approved. We could save a lot of time in court questions. So that's a, a, a B in an elderly moment. There was a very nice story that came, I think, out of that inquiry. There is a, a police acronym, TIE, Trace, Interrogate, and Eliminate, when you're going around the edges of these diagrams. And there was one suspect who was picked up somewhere in deep South America. And the, I think it was the next police rang up and said, you've know, got this guy, what, what, what's the situation? Well, we've traced him, we've interrogated him, but I'm not sure about the eliminating. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it wants to be my mind to prove yet again that what technology has been doing all over the years, perhaps in different ways, enables people to do things they could just do before without it. And uh, this is an example of the technology is now being you know, taken to the matter. So thank you very much indeed. Close and make some announcements. Uh, first of all, about our next meetings. Um, we meet again in January, or to be precise, on the 17th of January. Uh, electronic publishing uh, being led by David Penfold, David Brailsford, and Conrad Taylor. And then we have a meeting in March 20th, the BBC Micro and its Legacy. Uh, this is taking up from the talk we had from David Allen at the TCS 50 conference in July. He's bringing other friends of his from the BBC and places to tell us they're at their part in all the other things they did, like the Tuesday project and so on. I also like to draw your attention to the fact that the Society now has a, a new, approved, brand new, shiny website, thanks to Alan Thompson and uh, our Secretary Kevin. Um, and so please use it. And it's, uh, we actually think it. Uh, when you click on things, other things go somewhere. <laughs> um, finally, uh, I want to give a fast warning of something as members of the CCH we'll be hearing about rather intensively in the next month. As you know, the Society is very strongly associated with the Science Museum here. The Science Museum is in a competition, or it hopes to be in a competition, organised by the National Lottery. Uh, it's one of these tele television things where they put on different competing projects and the public votes on you. Now, you may or may not like that idea, but in fact that's what Lottery is doing. And they're offering 50 million pounds to the winner, and the Science Museum is bidding to essentially create a new form of museum at Rawton near Swindon, which is where most of the artifacts are stored anyway. It's quite a different organization and quite a different system, but it will be very, very impressive. Uh, and uh, there are other projects in this, and I won't tell you what they are because it's not finally decided. I mean, we don't really know the science museum if it's fine or not, but we think it would be. Everyone will be asked to vote, the public will be asked to vote about this, either online or by email or by um, text or phone. And what the science museum is anxious to do, and we're anxious to help them, is get the vote out. We're not so much concerned to persuade you to vote for them, though we have to do, but vote at all. Uh, and a lot of effort has been put into this uh, campaign. Uh, we will be mailing. CCS, the BCS will be making public, and just hope people will pay attention to it and don't go to the Science Museum. There's 50 million at stake there, um, and I can certainly commend it to you. Right, that's it for today. Um, can I make one comment on that? George. You've made that point clear to the 50 people who are here. Uh, is it possible to make it uh, available to uh, the hundreds of people who are members of the Society? Yes, we're going to send them out shortly. We should send an email probably to all those on, e on email. We should send a, a full mail shot to the other members. Uh, I'm hoping the BCS will put it on their e-bulletin. Maybe we well, should do resurrection. Uh, there's, the next issue of resurrection has gone to press and there's a fire inside it mentioned. But all that, enjoy. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you all in January. Thank you.